This video was made possible thanks to your support on Patreon. Subscribe on Patreon for early access to videos and additional content. The country of England is known for many things. Its understated natural beauty, its red telephone boxes, its black cabs, and its many successful musical exports, including Oasis and The Beatles. However, it's also home to many of the world's eeriest mysteries, including a wide array of unsolved cold cases, many of which have since faded from public view. In today's episode, we'll be exploring two unsettling cases from England. But first, I'd like to thank June's Journey for sponsoring today's video. One thing we all share is a love of true crime, but it goes without saying that the subject matter we frequently discuss can be quite dark. It's important to find reprieve from the heavy hitting stories, and with June's Journey, you can find the opportunity to both escape the intensity of real world horrors and still absorb your daily quota of true crime content. June's Journey is a murder mystery and hidden objects game that transports you back to the 1920s, following amateur detective June Parker as she investigates her family and attempts to solve her sister's unsolved murder. Using unbelievably radiant and beautiful animation, June's journey turns back the clock and puts you in charge of solving cases in the game's iconic 1920s style and mysterious atmosphere. Not only does the story keep you invested, but it provides an easygoing playstyle that lets you take breaks and pick it back up whenever you need. While the murder mystery aspect of the game makes it perfect for armchair detectives who want to do a little bit of interactive sleuthing themselves, June's Journey is also a wonderful way to take a step back from the macabre and relax. It's a beautiful and calming game that still stretches your observation and discovery skills. The best part is it's completely free to download on both iOS and Android devices. And if mobile gaming isn't your fancy, the game is also available via Facebook and Amazon. So use our link in the description to install June's Journey and take your own adventure into the colorful world of roaring 1920s crime and support Cold Case Detective at the same time. And now let's dive in to two cold cases from England. Maureen Dutton. The unsolved murder of Maureen Dutton in 1961 is perhaps one of Liverpool's most shocking and gruesome cold cases. Maureen was just 27 at the time of her death and was a typical English housewife. Her husband, Brian, was a research chemist who worked for the Imperial Chemical Industry Company, often shortened to the ICI. Just three weeks earlier, Maureen had given birth to the couple's second child, Andrew. They already had a two-year-old, a little boy named David. By all accounts, the couple had a happy marriage and lived a normal life, which is perhaps why Maureen's murder was all the more disturbing and shocking to the local community. On December 21st, 1961, Maureen stayed home all day at the couple's house on Thingwall Lane in the area of Knotty Ash. She had intended on taking David to visit the nearby Childwall Parish Church, but she didn't want to take Andrew, as it was cold and foggy out, so she called her mother-in-law, Elsie, and asked her to babysit later that day. However, Elsie had to cancel the arrangement because the fog had gotten so thick she was unable to traverse it, and so Maureen's plans were abandoned, and she stayed home with her children. She was last known to be alive at around 1.30 p.m. that afternoon. Just after 6 p.m., Brian returned home from work and was immediately suspicious when he was greeted with both darkness and silence. With two young children, the house was never quiet. Maureen was always bustling about, carrying out household tasks while caring for her two young boys. Brian's suspicions grew when he saw the family's half-eaten lunch still on the kitchen table. He moved through to the living room, and it was there he found his family. In the middle of the room was Maureen. She'd been stabbed 14 times in the chest, 
throat, and back. It is widely believed that David, who was sitting nearby, dazed and gazing at his mother, witnessed the crime. Andrew was in his crib nearby. The children were thought to have been alone for the best part of six hours. Investigators at the Old Swan Police Station immediately launched an inquiry into the horrific slaying of the mother of two. They believed a long bladed knife was the murder weapon and searched nearby bushes and shrubs for any sign of the object. They even searched drains on the streets, but turned up nothing. There was no obvious forensic evidence available, Maureen had not been sexually assaulted, and there was no signs of forced entry, nor had anything been taken from the home, all of which made it difficult for authorities to pinpoint the motive. After carrying out door-to-door -door inquiries, police discovered that nobody had been seen coming or going from the home, and nobody had heard screaming or a struggle. Then a young woman came forward with an interesting story. After seeing the newspaper report of Maureen's death, the young woman who lived in nearby Halewood told authorities that she had been visited by a young man who claimed to be a doctor. Like Maureen, the young woman had recently given birth. She assumed that the doctor had been sent to check on her as part of her postnatal care, but this was not the case. After her husband returned from work, she told him that the doctor had indecently assaulted her, which prompted her husband to make inquiries about the so-called doctor. He was told that there was no doctor operating in the area at that time. The man was described as being between the ages of 27 and 30, wearing horn-rimmed glasses and a dark grey overcoat. On the back of this information, police theorized that Maureen had let the killer into her home under the belief that he was some kind of professional, like a doctor or a nurse. Perhaps the 27 year old had fought back when he tried to sexually assault her and the culprit flew into a rage and attacked her with the knife. Another strange possible suspect in the case was that of the quote, good looking stranger. This man was described as being rather young and wearing a leather jacket. He was seen several times in the vicinity of the street on the day of the crime. Witnesses saw him running very fast down the road that afternoon, and not long afterwards, he was seen being violently sick outside of the Court Hay Methodist Church. One onlooker noted that the man kept his hands in his pockets the entire time he was vomiting, which they thought was very peculiar. One woman claimed they'd seen the man on the day of the incident, he had knocked on her door and stood before her clapping his hands. Frightened, the woman slammed the door on him and locked it. By January 17th, the police had gathered over 20,000 statements. With the help of witnesses, they put together a composite image of what they thought the man might have looked like. The Liverpool Echo featured the picture on the front of their paper, and within the first 24 hours of it being published, 60 people contacted authorities with information. However, the names that were given to the police were steadily eliminated, and the man in the leather jacket was never identified. The next suspect in the case was a young blonde woman who was seen acting suspiciously when she boarded a bus close to the crime scene. This unidentified woman boarded the number 10D bus on East Prescott Road. She reportedly had an Irish accent and muttered about how she needed to leave the city immediately. Upon exiting the bus, she repeatedly said, oh my God, the woman has never been traced and never come forward. The most bizarre theory to ever be explored in Maureen's case was done so by investigators acting under the orders of Deputy Chief Constable of Liverpool, a man named Herbert Barmer. He theorized that the 27 year old housewife had been executed in a sacrificial killing by a Polynesian cult Several of the cult's followers lived in Liverpool, and it was believed that they were making sacrifices to their god Tiki during the winter solstice, the time period in which Maureen was slain. The members were also known to have a tattoo of a reversed swastika. Whether this theory holds any weight at all is unknown, but it is what the deputy chief constable believed. Eventually, authorities landed on a suspect by following this theory. A 24-year-old nurse living in Upper Parliament Street was arrested and charged for stealing equipment and drugs from three Liverpool hospitals in 1962. He reportedly pretended to be a doctor and had the reversed swastika tattoo. However, the man was subsequently ruled out as being involved with the murder of Maureen, and the entire theory was abandoned. 
Authorities regularly review the files and evidence in Maureen's case, and made a fresh appeal for information as recently as 2016. Despite authorities uncovering numerous compelling suspects, Maureen's case remains unsolved. If the culprit is still alive today, it's likely they are at least in their 70s, meaning it is unlikely authorities will be able to bring them to justice. Lynn Bryant At the time of her passing in 1998, Lynn Bryant was a mother of two who had been planning her 41st birthday celebrations. Although her case received tremendous amounts of media attention at the time, it has all but disappeared from the minds of the public today. Described by her loved ones as popular, sociable, and family-oriented, Lynn was well-liked and well-known by locals in the village where she lived, Ruan High Lanes in South Cornwall. She had two daughters, 19-year-old Erin and 21-year-old Lee, who just had her own first child. The 10-month-old baby was Lynn's first grandchild, and she was looking forward to seeing her family continue to grow in the future. On the morning of Tuesday, October 20th, 1998, Lynn went to work as usual. She was a cleaner for a nearby house. Upon finishing, the 40-year-old dropped in to visit her parents before returning home. At around 12.45 p.m., Lynn drove her gray Ford Sierra to Harris Garage at the village of Tregony, but she found out they were out of fuel. Next, she drove to Chenoweth Garage at Ruan High Lanes, where she bought milk, gas, and a few groceries. While there, a scruffy white car-derived van was seen entering the forecourt. It was driven by an unknown bearded man. Law enforcement later noted that a similar vehicle had been seen in the days before Lynn's death, but both it and the driver were unknown to locals in the area. After visiting the garage, Lynn had lunch with her daughter, Erin. The pair chatted about Lynn's upcoming birthday and watched Emmerdale between 1 and 1.30 p.m. Just after half past one, the 40-year-old took the family dog, a lurcher named Jay, out for a walk. Her family told authorities that Lynn always took the same route. Several witnesses reported seeing her on her way, and told law enforcement later that nothing seemed amiss. A passing motorist saw Lynn talking to a man at the junction by Ruan High Lane's Methodist Chapel. The man is described as being clean-shaven, in his 30s, about 5 foot 9, and wearing light-coloured clothing. This is the last known sighting of Lynn alive. At 12.30pm, Lynn's body was found by a woman driving up the lane between the chapel and Treville's Manor. Panicked, the woman reversed her car back down the road and alerted a local farmer who recognised the body. While emergency services were called, by the time the air ambulance arrived at 2.50pm, Lynn was long dead. She had sustained multiple knife wounds to her neck and back, with the fatal blow striking her in the chest. Authorities noted that the 40-year-old had fought her attacker viciously and that her clothing was disturbed, which led them to believe she had been the victim of a sexually motivated assault. Law enforcement determined that the murder weapon was a single-edged blade between 10 and 14 centimeters long. It was likely either a pen knife or a small kitchen knife, but so far it has never been located, despite the fact that police immediately carried out a fingertip search of the area after Lynn's body was found. One interesting clue found at the scene was the vivid blue polyester cotton mix fibers that were located on Lynn's body. The fibers have never been matched to a specific garment, but are commonly used in both polo shirts and sweatshirts. They are alien to Lynn and her home, leading investigators to conclude that they must have come from the perpetrator. Authorities also stated that due to the struggle and the mud splatter found on the 40-year-old's clothing, they believe the culprit would have mud and blood on their clothing. Another local farmer told the police that he'd seen a man walking across his field between 2.45 and 3 p.m. This was unusual to him, because there was no footpath across the area, and it was never used by walkers. He noted that the man wasn't dressed for a walk or a hike either, wearing regular, everyday clothing instead. Another bizarre incident that occurred in Lynn's case was that of her tortoise shell glasses, which she had been wearing when she left the house earlier, but were not found on or with her body. They also did not turn up when the police searched the area. 
Four months later, however, on February 2nd of 1999, the glasses were located, sitting on top of the mud at the gateway where the mother of two's body was found. Authorities have been unable to determine where they came from, suspecting that either a member of the public found them or that the perpetrator of the crime had taken them as a trophy and, for some reason, returned them afterwards. The investigation into Lynn's horrific murder was long. 3,144 house-to-house -house inquiry forms were completed, 1,600 alibis were established, 7,884 statements were taken, and 6,573 vehicles were traced and eliminated. All men between the ages of 14 and 70 who were living in a one mile radius of the crime scene were traced and their alibis checked and corroborated. Due to the remote location of the crime scene, authorities concluded that the culprit was either a local to the area or knew it well. Perhaps they worked nearby or had family who lived in the community. In 2015, investigators who were reviewing the case managed to pull a partial DNA profile from the evidence. Although DNA samples had been taken in 1998, authorities had to begin the process all over again with some 6,000 people in 2016. This was because new legislation, which had come into effect three years earlier, had compelled law enforcement to destroy the old samples. So far, however, these efforts have not led to an arrest or a conviction, although three suspects were cleared using the DNA profile. In 2018, on the 20th anniversary of Lynn's death, authorities put out a fresh appeal for information, which led them to receive 160 calls. 27 new leads involving 13 people came as a result. That same year, a reconstruction of the 40-year-old's last known movements was made and released to the public. The three men police wished to speak to have never come forward or been identified. These men include the man seen driving the white car-derived van, the man who spoke with Lynn at the chapel, and the man who was witnessed walking across the field. It's unknown if any of them have anything to do with the crime. In 2016, a former intelligence officer named Chris Clark put forward the theory that Lynn's case is linked with that of Helen Fleet and Kate Bushell, both of whom were murdered while dog walking. Kate Bushell was just 14 years old when she was found dead in Exwick, Exeter on November 15th, 1997. She had been out walking the neighbor's dog when she was found. She had a knife wound to the neck. Helen Fleet was 66 years old when she was beaten to death while walking her dogs on March 28th of 1987 in Walbury Woods in Western Supermare. Both cases have never been solved and law enforcement has never officially linked the three murders. Lynn Bryant's case also remains unsolved. 300 mourners attended her funeral at Penmount Crematorium in Truro on December of 1998. Crime Stoppers is currently offering a £10,000 reward for any information which could lead to an arrest. If you have any information about Lynn's case or Maureen's, you can contact Crime Stoppers anonymously at 0800 555 111. And there you have the facts. Please leave a comment down below with your own theories and speculations, and remember to like this video and subscribe to support the channel. You can also support us on Patreon for access to behind the scenes content and early access to our documentaries. Thank you for watching. Stay alert, stay safe, and I'll see you next time.